government to, to release Hala from imprisonment. If anyone wants further information, our website uh, can be visited or the website freehala.org. Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome to the Wilson Center today Carolyn McCaskey, an old friend of mine. We've been collaborators going back to, uh, I think, 1996, uh, the Arusha process on, on Burundi. And uh, I have worked with her both in that capacity when she was uh, uh, leading one of the committees that was part of the uh, Arusha process, uh, the Burundi peace process. Uh, then at that point, she was a member of the Canadian government. Um, she had begun her career with CETA uh, before coming to the United Nations um, and had been a, played, played a prominent role in multilateral negotiations as a Canadian delegate to the UN funds and programs and to the international financial institutions. Uh, subsequently, she was appointed Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs uh, and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator at the UN Secretariat in New York from 1999 to 2004. Um, and then prior to her current appointment as Assistant Secretary General for, for Peacebuilding Support, she was the Special Representative of the Secretary General, uh, head of the uh, peacekeeping operation mission in Burundi. And uh, it was an extraordinary to watch Carolyn in that particular role and uh, understand her and the emphasis she gave to building a really much more holistic, systemic approach to peace building that was integrative of all the various functions of the United Nations. I've seldom met anyone in the diplomatic service or in the, at the United Nations that was as what I might characterize as process sensitive as, as Carolyn. I think we shared a, a very common view about a missing element in, in much diplomacy these days. So it was a joy to work with her on that occasion, and I was uh, delighted when she was then received her subsequent appointment to head up the Peacebuilding Support Office of the United Nations, established to support the Peacebuilding Commission. We've asked her today to provide an assessment of the Peacebuilding Commission, its vision, the challenges that uh, are foreseen in, in, the, in the months and years ahead for the effectiveness of the Commission and to try to help us understand the role of the Peacebuilding Commission in the broader architecture of the United Nations. Welcome to the, to the Wilson Center, Carolyn. Well, thank you very much, Howard. Now I know why I accept these invitations, is to have your, is to hear your dear friends say nice things about you. <laughs> um, and I'd like to return the compliment. Uh, working with Howard has been very exciting and uh, uh, it's interesting. You could almost say that, that we came at it from different angles, but in fact, it was really the same angle. And there I was with this mega project with troops and thousands of civilians. And there was Howard with uh, a couple of guys, <laughs> starting from scratch and uh, talking to people in the grassroots. And, you know, at the end of the day, you may have left more of a footprint, Howard, with... Uh, the Burundi Leadership Training Program and the way he brought people together. So it was a privilege to see you at work as well. And uh, I'm very pleased to see your model being applied in uh, different uh, circumstances and other situations. The uh, No, after Burundi, I thought I would retire and go home to my little house on the hill in Canada. Um, but I got tempted because uh, over the last... Uh, Oh, a decade, perhaps more, uh, the international community has been trying to design approaches to filling what we used to call the gap. And I think most of you around this table know what I'm talking about, that uh, the whole question of how do you manage the process of passing the torch from you know, the peacemakers or the peacekeepers or the, the ones with the heavy equipment and the, or the humanitarians. In other words, the whole set of crisis responders to the development actors. And uh, how do we get that to overlap so that the gains of the humanitarian and the peace processes aren't lost in the time it takes for the development actors to get up and going? 
And a friend of mine, the UN, describes, uh, described this process of the UN version of the relay race where you're running with the baton and then you stop and you look around and you figure out who do I hand the baton to and then you find someone, then you negotiate with them and then they start running. And how do you get into a situation where you have a real relay race where the runners are running side by side and the passing of the baton is a smooth one? And uh, I consider it nothing short of miraculous that in 2005, when the atmosphere in the UN amongst member states was at, uh, I won't say an all-time low because I haven't dealt with the UN for all of its 60 years, but enough to say that it was a very critical low period. And yet somehow the political will was there to put in place a whole new set of uh, what's called the peace-building architecture. And uh, that's the Peace Building Commission, which is 31 member states. It's an advisory body, intergovernmental advisory body. Um, one's not quite sure always what that means, but uh, there are those who uh, try to explain these things. A Peace Building Support Office, which is supposed to be a modest, non-operational secretariat to the Commission. And a Peace Building Fund which is set up as an initial target of $250 million. And uh, we have pledges of 220 on that already, so it's not doing badly. But which should really be seen not as the answer to peace building, because peace building is far more expensive than $250 million will get you. The, um, the whole discussion, as I said, started years ago looking at this transitional process and the discussion over what was peace building. Is peace building the political process? Is it the development process? Is it the security process? Is it human rights? Is it nation building? What is it? And the answer, I think, is a good one. The answer is all of the above. And that the way to do peace building and to think of peace building is in terms of the end state. That peace building is what you need to do to get a country to a point where it has a sustainable capability to stay on track and to meet the expectations of its population. And uh, that means that you have to think of peace building in terms of uh, the peace accords, the, the peacekeeping, and the development, and also the whole range of activities for which we do not yet have tools, and that is providing assistance to countries recently out of conflict. So peace building is everything, and that's one of the reasons why my particular office was set up as a small office reporting directly to the Secretary General. And by the way, under the new Secretary General, that has been reconfirmed. We report to the Secretary General and we work with political affairs and the UN development program and peacekeeping operations and all the different parts of the UN um, that are involved in peace building and particularly with the field. But uh, our main job is, was to start up the commission and to give it a personality and help it to decide what it was all about. Because one of the things that I discovered soon after taking on the job was that when you have 31 member states, it's impossible to expect them to come up with a clear concept of what it's all about. And for the first few months, the, a lot of questions were asked. Where is the Peace Building Commission going? What's it doing? Is it any good or whatever? And to be honest, I felt a lot of these questions were unfair. Um, the Security Council has had 60 years and is still trying to get it right. Um, but they're, they're better and uh, getting better, I hope, and, but there's still a lot of problems there. And uh, if you look at the track record internationally over the last uh, 10 years or so, or even from, say, 1992 onwards, you will see that despite the fact that we think we live, well, we know we live in a dangerous world and we're bombarded every day in more ways than one with Iraq and Afghanistan and the Middle East, the fact is there are fewer conflicts in the world now than there were in 1992. There are fewer battle-related deaths, according to the Human Security Project. I know their statistics are sometimes questionable, but globally there is a trend there uh, in terms of the smaller uh, civil conflicts 
uh, around around the the world that there are far fewer of them and that if you look across the African spectrum particularly you can honestly say that there are a lot of conflicts that were raging a few years ago that are either on their way to being solved, some have been solved, and others are at least showing signs of improvement. So there is a trend there. But the question is, how do you keep them on track? And the, the statistical research was showing us that far too many were falling back. Now, what's interesting is that the the research, in fact, is now being refined, and now we're being told, well, actually, it wasn't that, wasn't 44 and two-thirds mm -hmm. percent. It's more like 25 to 30 percent. Um, I have a message that came in on my BlackBerry in the last 24 hours, in fact. So what do we do, go and dismantle the peace-building machinery? I hope not. Uh, the fact is countries still do, uh, there are in serious danger of falling back. And one of the reasons that was uh, that there was general, on which there was general agreement and which the Peace Building Commission now has fundamentally as part of its goal is this whole question of um, sustained attention or lack of it versus lack of attention. And what was happening in too many of these crises is that you had, you know, the humanitarian relief, you had the, uh, in many cases, the peacekeepers, and then maybe even some electoral assistance, and then people said, oh, well, fine, you know, off you go, you're on your own. And boom, you know, how many times have we gone into Haiti now? Someone told me six. Uh, we have to stop doing this. And uh, so the objective of the Peace Building Commission is to to do exactly that, to figure out what are we doing wrong and what can we do to do differently. And that's not easy. Now, one of the first things in their resolution is to bring together all the relevant actors, and I think this is very important because all of you dealing with these issues, I'm sure, will agree with me when I say that it sounds like a truism, but if you don't have all the people around the table and a healthy discussion on what this crisis is really all about, you're all going to be running down different rabbit holes. And uh, it's very important to have a common understanding of what the fault lines of this particular society are and where the weaknesses lie and where the real needs of this society are in terms of international assistance and support. And I don't mean just financial support, although quite frankly, one of the big issues for these countries is the fact that they have been the aid orphans. There is a correlation between their aid status and uh, their ability to recoup after conflict. And if we don't address that, we won't succeed. But there are other issues. There's the whole issue of political support and the mere fact of having the eye of the world on you. Now, Burundi and Sierra Leone were the are the first two countries under consideration by the Commission. And uh, they were referred at their request, by the way, and this is very important, at their request by the Security Council and uh, in the language of the in advisory body, f they were referred for advice. Now, in fact, the Commission has taken a fairly uh, hearty approach to trying to deal with these two countries. And uh, my office has worked very closely with individual members of the Commission uh, and then collectively to design a pr an approach which is going to produce an overarching peace-building strategy for these two countries. Now, oh yeah, another UN piece of paper, everybody says, where's that going to get us? Well, what we're trying to do is address the fact that a lot of work is already being done in these countries. You have the World Bank PRSP process, the UN development frameworks, the government's own plans, the Security Council mandate, uh, all sorts of things going on. And the danger with all of these things is that uh, it addresses everything, uh, for good reason. A country coming out of war, rebuilding every sector is a priority. That's where th their needs are cover the waterfront. But what the strategic approach tries to do is to work with the World Bank and the UN and the donors and primarily with the government because if they're not 
in the driver's seat, we won't get anywhere, and with civil society and the population at large, and say, out of all of this, what are your half dozen priorities? What are the issues which, if you do not address, you risk falling back into crisis? So one of the things the Burundi government is doing in this process is something which we talked to them about a long time ago and but which we didn't have the leverage nor did they have the experience in their first few days of after the election to commit to. And they are now committed to a nationwide dialogue process. Because the Bur I think that uh, Howard would agree with me that one of the great success of the Burundi process was that it took a long time. And over time, it built up, uh, they built up a capacity to dialogue and to talk to each other. The Burundians stared their demons in the face in terms of ethnicity, and they dealt with them. And they are capable of coming out the other side now because of that and leaving ethnicity behind them and accepting ethnicity as a cultural fact and not as a political or a... Um, a security issue. But uh, so the strategic process is something that we're well on our way to completing on Burundi. The uh, Commission set itself on a, a deadline of this um, uh, June, because that's their first anniversary, uh, to complete the strategic overview for its first two countries in the, on the understanding that come. Uh, uh, September we might have a couple of other countries coming on board and that you could move into out of an intense phase of engaging with these countries into a process of monitoring and figuring out what to do to keep on track and making sure that people met the commitments making sure that additional money was actually coming in for them because as I said without that we will fail um, but we're on track for Burundi, but not for Sierra Leone, for the rather obvious reason we should have figured out is they're under election this summer. So you don't drum up a strategy with the outgoing government. You wait till you have a new one in place. Now, um, the test for the commission uh, will be, will this strategic approach make a difference? How do we apply it? Um, and. I, within that, one of the issues which concerns me is the need for the Commission to operate individually as well as collectively. It's very easy in the UN for members of a governing body to hide behind, oh well, we will advocate this and we will do this and we will do that. But it'll only work on peace building if every single member state at the table and institution, because we have the bank, the fund, the European Commission, the Islamic conference countries. Um, every single one of them takes away from the table a feeling that they are responsible and that Burundi has to become a new area of responsibility for them. And when I hear members of the Commission saying, oh, well, Burundi is not one of our traditional countries, my answer is, yeah, that's a problem. And what are you going to do about it? And uh, that will be the test case. Because people have uh, I've answered a lot of questions this morning uh, uh, since I've been in Washington today saying, so what, you know, how will the commission prove that it's done a good job? And the only way it can prove that it's kept its client countries on track will be after the fact. It's, you, I mean, I could say, well, there haven't been any wars in Burundi in the last six months, you know, but that's not going to cut any ice. Um, I can really only say that with conviction five <coughs> years from now, that they have not fallen back within the first five years. Um, so what is the measure of success? And to my mind, the measure of success will be that they have succeeded in turning the idea of sustained attention into concrete presence. And that means that there would be more countries engaged with Burundi, a broader donor base, the political neighbors who really brought the peace process home. I mean, the uh, Regional Peace Initiative for Burundi is, is where you lay the real credit for peace in Burundi, along with the efforts of the Burundians themselves, but that they stay engaged as neighbors. So these are the indicators of success, and that the government themselves is committed, but the government needs the support. 
because Burundi and Sierra Leone have, you know, three, four, five traditional donors and Tanzania and Kenya and Senegal and Mali have 24, 25 donors. There has to be a correlation there. Now, part of the job of my office will be to try to take some of these facts and analysis and try to do, uh, to get beyond the anecdotal stage and come up with um, either the research, not that we ourselves would do research, but we would work with bodies who do research. And we would uh, look for funding for that from uh, the international community uh, to work on some of these issues. What are the fault lines in a country coming out of crisis? And are there lessons you can learn for country X or are there lessons, and, uh, and are there lessons you can learn for that would have more universal applicability? So all in all, for the first year report card, I would say that the Commission has succeeded rather well in defining uh, its core approach, um, but that individually as members, they now need to show commitment uh, to making it work. And um, as I say, that will, uh, that will take an act of political will on the part of the members and not just of the Commission as a whole. I'm going to stop there. I think I've exceeded my 15 minutes a bit, but uh, I'll stop and uh, okay. throw the floor open. Shall I stay here or sit Should down or whatever? Here? No, I, I can see everybody here. That's okay. Right. Well, Even though I'm slightly uh, blinded by those well lights. Thank you. So. Um, let me just kind of kick it off with just, just a, uh, one question. Um, I, I read recently uh, analysis that was undertaken, I think, for the European Union uh, or the European Commission about looking at what should be the EU's role and mm -hmm. support and how should it approach and look at the question of the Peace Building Commission. And there were several issues raised, not, not resolved in any definitive way, but at least raised as questions. And I'd just be interested in your kind of reaction to some of those issues that were raised in this one analysis. One was the, that the mandate of the Commission, as it was finally established, was restricted apparently to post-conflict. You know, right. Whereas prevention. without prevention, yeah. and that raised a whole series of questions about you know, the continuity of peace building, which you yourself mentioned in your kind of introduction. Yes. And I'm wondering how, that, how you see that playing itself out. Um, there was a second issue raised just in terms of the resourcing. As being rather limited in resource, and thirdly, the fact that your advisory, without kind of mm -hmm. any kind of independent authoritative capacity, right. in some ways, right. your reaction to those kinds of concerns as they've been expressed. And well, the the documentation that launched the idea is the expert group and the Secretary General's report in 2004-2005, um, clearly carved out a broader uh, field that included conflict prevention. Um, the General Assembly ch chewed that one up and spat it out. They didn't swallow it. The uh, conflict prevention is a very difficult thing for UN member states to accept because it implies a level of judgment that you have a conflict that we're going to come in and prevent. And th Whereas conflict that has broken out is pretty hard to say, oh, sorry, no, there's no problem, we don't need your help. Um, so the whole conflict prevention thing is politically a hot potato in the General Assembly. And so the mandate of the Commission was very deliberately s limited to post-conflict peace building. Although there is a little wrinkle in the resolution where we refer to countries in danger of lapsing or relapsing into conflict. Somebody snuck that one in. Uh, but it's not a very large door, and we can't drive much of a truck through that door. So, mm -hmm. um, But, you know, the... Uh, the EU is, um, you know, they were part of the negotiators. It's their resolution, too. So um, I get a little, well, I, ra I, I raise my eyebrows, you know, <laughs> when groups of member states come back and said, oh, well, how come the Commission didn't agree to do that? Well, guys, you're the Commission. You tell me. Um, on the resources, um, well, there again, uh, the issue of resources is uh, an interesting question. And the, right now, the European Commission is the, the largest single donor to most of these countries. When I say they're aid orphans, the Commission is nearly always there. So they are doing their bit in that sense. Um, 
But, uh, you know, they're the ones with the resources. How can they say the Commission doesn't have resources? Are they going to give it resources? I'm not sure. I'd like to see the article on which you <laughs> based that comment and what they actually mean by that. Because wasn't the e it wasn't the EC coming, it was an analyst that was an hired analyst. To, okay. to, to do a report for the for EC. For them. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, people equate the peace building fund with resources for peace building. <coughs> now, uh, even a small peacekeeping mission like mine in Burundi uh, cost $300 million a year. Liberia is costing $700 million a year. So $250 million is seed money. Um, my goal, and of course I'm not going to achieve this, but uh, at least not in my lifetime, but I would hope eventually, my goal would be to see the kind of automaticity of resources for peace building that there is for peacekeeping. Um, because it's a good investment, as apart from any driving force of human justice and the need to prevent people from having to suffer from yet another war. If we go into Haiti six times, that costs us big bucks every single time. Why not spend part of that up front and g build people uh, a, a, s a process which will prevent the suffering and prevent you having to pick up the tab for yet another peacekeeping mission? DRC, uh, it's costing, uh, Monarch in DRC is costs a billion dollars a year. This is a hell of an investment. So my view on the resourcing is that uh, the fact that the peace building fund was set up at 250 doesn't mean that the resources haven't been provided for peace building. What it means now is the commission should now address the issue of peace building resources and collectively provide those on an as required basis in terms of the clients they're dealing with. So that while I agree with the analysis, um, I think it's a timing issue and a sequencing issue. And that as we come up with a peace building process for country X, then that's the point at which those who have the resources should say, okay, we're going to find maybe a hundred million dollars for this country instead of the 500 million that it would cost us in peacekeeping if it falls back. Well, yeah. just, just to, just to one little detail and then we'll open it up yeah. to everyone here. Um, $35 million is the allocation that has been made. For the fund, yeah, to Burundi and uh, to Sierra Leone, out of my $250 million. So Is that 35 each? 35 yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that a one-shot or is yeah, that? that's it. Yeah, it's a start-up. Because I, no, I have no guarantee that I'll get more than $250 million, so I have to manage that. Is it 250 an annual allocation? No, it's a one so one yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a one-off. It's a s no. Well, it sh no. I shouldn't say that because some of the donors have said once you start spending, as the money goes out the door, we should be able to replenish. But there's no commitment to maintain it at 250 a year. But if we could get up to speed and prove that we could spend that money, then we could. Then you know, resources will come in. So we have to do our homework on getting the fund operational. Now the fund is not limited to countries under consideration by the Peace Building Commission. Secretary General can decide that another post-conflict country is eligible and we could spend some money there. They probably wouldn't get as big an allocation as a country that was on the PBC agenda. Um, but we would hope, and in fact when I say w I have 250 million, actually I have 135 because of the 250 target, 220 is pledged and 135 is in the bank. I can't commit I know the distinction. anything <laughs> beyond what's actually in the bank. But once, if I really get up close to spending that 135, I can go, uh, go after the money that's pledged, you know, so. Let's open it up. Would you please just identify yourselves and your affiliation as you ask your questions? Yes. There's a, uh, and there's a microphone that will be circulating here. <coughs> Uh, Nathaniel Hurt from uh, Mercy Corps. As you mentioned earlier, the support of member states is critical to the success of the Commission. And I was wondering how you would um, rate or describe the level of buy-in and support 
uh, from Washington for the Commission and also how you would uh, evaluate the communication between New York and Washington, Defense Department, State Department, Administration, Congress, et cetera, uh, about the Commission. And the context of the question is when I've had the opportunity to ask, again, State Department officials, Defense Department officials about the Commission, how does this figure in with your plans about post-conflict, reconstruction, stabilization, all these sorts of things, is either a blank look or, well, at some point, maybe, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering if you could get into that a little bit. Can we take a, maybe two or three packages? Tell me, is this Chatham House rules or what? <laughs> Other than the fact that you've got TV cameras looking at you. <laughs> Chatham House TV purposes. rules. Okay. <laughs> okay. My answer to that is ask the U.S. government. Then. <laughs> I'm asking them too. It's all right. When I get an answer, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a few questions and then um, together, and then we'll ask Carolyn to respond right. to them. Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, my name is uh, Edward Bell. I'm English. I'm visiting from London. I work for a, a peacebuilding organization called International Alert. Um, Carolyn, I have two, two questions for you, I'm afraid. Um, the first is when you talk about negotiation with government. Mm -hmm. I mean, in these countries, when you're talking about government, you're talking about an executive where power is shifting between different factions. Um, there are major problems on that score in, in Burundi. Uh, I wondered what divergences you come across in this vision of fault lines. Um, if what you need is a common vision of fault lines, mm -hmm. How far does that get you? The second is that um, aid, aid money, um, in this case the peace building fund, but generally can be something worth fighting for, certainly worth competing for. And there are deep concerns in both these countries we're talking about, about public financial management. Do you think the rhetoric on one year deadlines for spending the peace building fund money is a mistake? And, and a third question right down here, three, right there, yes. Hi, my name is Mindy Reiser. Many affiliations, but United Nations Association of the National Capital Area is mm -hmm. one. I'm curious about how you intend to bring together the various uh, interesting research that's going on. The International Crisis Group, of course, does very interesting work. Many of the think tanks. Do you think you'll convene some um, seminars or workshops bringing people together, distilling the best thinking and passing it on, having some of your people go out and do some field work? There's a mm -hmm. lot of research out there, amazing, and I'm curious amazing. what you're going to, to mm -hmm. do to add to that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, quite a very broad, uh, quite a broad range of questions. No, on the U.S. position, I don't want to be facetious. Um, the U.S. Some of my U.S. colleagues in in New York have said that they are, there is a wait and see attitude, and that there is a different level of interest from different parts of the government. But um, uh, my sense is that the uh, at the moment that the so far that the U.S. is is looking at it now with more interest that um, my, my position on this is that this is a very useful tool in those parts of the world where, which are the forgotten crises and that there is no value added for the Peace Building Commission in the crises that are already the subject of massive international attention. We have no value added in the Middle East, you know. I mean, what can we possibly add to that particular mix and the, all of the things that, and all of the players and all of the things that are trying to be done. Um, and my sense is that there, there is real interest in parts of the U.S. government in looking at the potential of the PBC uh, in uh, addressing some of these, uh, these uh, crises around the world. Um, the question of getting a common vision in dealing with governments um, well, you know, I'm a pragmatist. You, you have to start somewhere. And uh, the fact is that you have a, uh, a government in Burundi which has a, amongst its members a very broad range of experience, ranging from a lot to a little. Uh, this is a party that did not exist as a political party until they went out and got elected. Um, this is a party that won on the basis of a successful rebel movement. Now, as such, that's actually a very interesting proposition because unlike Sierra Leone, where this, the same old guys are in, still in power, um, you do actually, you have actually had a shift of power in Burundi 
And uh, the fact that they have committed, as I said, to this ongoing dialogue and that they are prepared at least to say publicly and in writing and sign it, that that is one of the keys to peace for them, I think we have to take uh, positively. Um, we've had a couple of close runs with Burundi over the last little while, and uh, each time they've managed to pull back from the brink. And they've solved some of their more egregious <laughs> errors through the rule of law, the Supreme Court, the rules of the party. But also because they have a, an ambassador in New York who's very close to the president and who in, you know, in Burundi language was saying, hey guys, you know, you're under the public eye, don't do this. And that's, that's to the credit of the existence, the symbolic power that the PBC can represent. So uh, I think we have to make haste slowly. Uh, you have to take a lot on trust. And uh, the issue, that's why I think the issue of sustained attention, which is outlined in the resolution, is so important. And not to say, okay, here's some money and the tools and the election and bye-bye and you're on your own. But the accompaniment, I think, is absolutely fundamental. That's how you do it. Uh, there's no one-year limit on the PBF. Um, you know, if it takes us longer to spend that, then we will. But the whole idea of the peacebuilding fund is not to substitute for long-term peacebuilding and recovery investments. Unless the international community wants to crank it up to a billion dollars a year for five countries uh, so that it's real money and it's real recovery money and it can fund the real recovery programs, the whole concept of the fund is seed money, is to you know drip a little oil in the carburetor so the engine will start, but that the supply is coming from the longer-term investment. So that's where the idea of a one-year limit has come. Not because we think there's a one-year limit on peace building. No, the whole idea is long-term sustained accompaniment. Um, on the research agenda, um, the one of the things that really struck me when I took on the job is that it's it's rather like the how the environment movement was 20 years ago, a tremendous mushrooming of uh, civil society institutions, academic institutions, government institutions, and interest around the world in peace building. And uh, uh, my, uh, initially I was, uh, I had this sort of wonderfully ambitious vision that we could be the knowledge center and create the, um, uh, the virtual networks that would bring all this together and people could post their research and find out what various events were going. And uh, I don't think we could ever trap it. I mean, I still think it's an interesting goal. And in fact, the Swiss government is working with us and has put a quarter of a million dollars into the a Harvard project to build a platform, uh, an electronic platform, that would at least identify and would be a place where peace building scholars and activists could register. And what we're able to do with that, time will tell. It's very early days yet. I haven't seen the design of the, pr the proposal. They're going to come back to us with a proposal of some things that are possible. So that's one element of it. The other element of it is that our office will never be big enough to actually do that. And what we need to do is find a way of networking with the research community and uh, identifying, hopefully, what we could do through the work with the Peace Building Commission and the work with the various actors on the ground is identify some critical gaps in the research uh, in terms of uh, bringing information in on lessons learned and uh, things that can be applied and things that would either have specific application in the case of country X or more universal application in terms of why states fail at the most broad level or down to the more specific issues. Um, that if we can work with the research community um, and, and the donor community, we can bring those two communities together. Because what I'm hoping is that we will be able to attract funding to do that. And then if we have the funding to do that, then we will find the researchers. Because if it's known that we have the money for the research, then the researchers, I'm pretty sure, will self-identify. <laughs> Okay, some just new questions. Up front here, Sarah. <clears throat> uh, my name is uh, Thierry Wamahoro. I'm, uh, I'm an intern with the Wilson 
I was in Santa. Actually, this is my first day. From I'm also <laughs> from Burundi. I'm a horror. Yeah. I'm from Burundi. <laughs> uh, I'm also um, a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I just first want to thank you for uh, your involvement in the resolution of the Burundian conflict. In 2005, there was um, students from the second grade students who were asked who was the president of Burundi, and they mentioned your name. <laughs> so that showed how involved, how heavily involved you were in that in that country. Um, my question: I don't know what what is your assessment of the current political situation, security situation in Burundi, um, given that Burundi is the one that took pilot countries in the, in the in the efforts of the peace building commission. What would Burundi, God forbid, Burundi falling back? What would, how would that affect the, the the credibility and the future of uh, the peace building commission? Um, because we have, I read an article this morning by, or well, Anne Arbor said, she's with the human rights of uh, the, uh, the UN, that Burundi and Congo could, if the issues of transitional justices aren't, justice isn't taken seriously, uh, the, that, that, this country could fall back into conflict. Uh, we have in Burundi the, um, a president who is, according to some people, face, could face impeachment soon. He has no majority in the, majority in the National Assembly anymore. Uh, we have reports of training grounds for railroads that we don't know who they, the allegiance to. Um, so there are some not so great things happening right now. So what's your assessment and how will that affect the credibility in the future of, uh, of mm -hmm. the Peace Building Commission? Over here. Andrew Rice of the United Nations Association. Uh, I wonder if you could explain to us a little more how the commission works in an advisory capacity. It isn't what happens in a commission session. Uh, how are issues put on the agenda? Is there an effort to reach a consensus? Uh, what, what is the procedural working of this advisory body? Mm -hmm. And then in the back. Uh, Thanks. Um, my name is Martin Thiessen. I work for Thierry pro-integrity organization in London. I was just thinking about your indicators of success. You were talking about the amounts of aid, long-term commitments, and a diverse donor base. I was wondering if the transparency of the aid to the countries and the accountability to the citizens above and beyond financial accountability to the donors um, was an issue potentially for the Commission mm -hmm. in the work that we've done, both in forgotten crises and non-forgotten crises. It's a, it's a big, big point. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, well, my turn. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for the easy questions. <laughs> um, well, the political situation in Burundi, that's a tough one. Um, it's interesting how often this question comes up, that, uh, that there are still caches of arms that there are still rebel groups being trained, that there are still people who are prepared to take the country down the old roads. Um, and uh, I've even gone so far as to talk dramatically of the dark underbelly of the Burundi politic, but of the Burundi body politic. And uh, the question more is how can Burundians themselves create a different kind of discourse. That there's a, a level up to which the international community has to help. And Burundi has been neglected. And the commission has to bring an end to that neglect. But it has to be partnered by people in Burundi who will honestly say never again. That's where Howard comes in, in uh, the kind of cross-sectoral, cross-ethnic, cross-gender, cross-political work that he's doing, and other institutions like Search for Common Ground, Interpeace, and uh, this is why the work of civil society uh, is so, so important. Uh, because government, I mean, you say that the party now has lost its majority in the parliament, and um, I didn't realize that that was actually true. Um, I know that there was the fear that uh, numbers of MPs would go with Rajabu and that Nkurunziza, CNDDF, Didi, and Nkurunziza would lose its 59%. Uh, 
I hadn't actually heard that that has actually happened. And with Rajabu now in jail, um, I think that that's maybe less likely to happen. I think it was very dangerous of Ankur and Ziza to try to oust all the Rajabu supporters in government because then you're handing him a constituency. Better to turn to these people and say, never mind, we're a new government, you can stay, you know, be part of the family and co-opt them. And I know Tanzania worked very hard with Ankur and Ziza to make sure that would happen. So there's the regional peace process still playing a, an important role. <coughs> you know, that's why I say it's, t it's money's important, but it'll take more than money. And these things have to be uh, encouraged. Um, the, you know, w we used to hear stories of rebel groups across the lake that, that the S Ankur and Ziza had kept, you know, a cadres and arms, you know, in case he lost the election, he would swoop on Bujumbura. I honestly, I don't know how true these are. A lot of these rumors are the product of the real politique in Burundi and the, the lack of trust. Um, and that's why I think the international community has to be very careful how they deal with the government in power. Good. And I very, I'm very nervous when some of the donors say, you know, you're breaking all the rules, you've got to do better on this and you've got to do better on that. We have to understand that this is a fragile situation. And I think we have to go about dealing with issues of, um, and this partly deals with um, Martin's question on, on transparency, uh, that we need to build up a culture of human rights and a culture of transparency. Uh, rather than a punitive approach to human rights and uh, trans and corruption, because and at the same time, because I have found that what my Burundian colleagues hear much more readily is if you say to them, "Look, you've just gone through the war. You've gone through a very good electoral process. The international community needs to hold you to the standards of a modern state. There are things you have to do, but." We understand what you've been through, we understand how you got there, and we will work with you to make sure you meet those standards. Rather than sitting back, and I get very upset with some of the major donors who sit back and point the finger and say, you know, st you've got to stop all this human rights abuse by your soldiers. The soldiers live off the land. The government cannot afford to pay to house and feed the soldiers. Address that problem and you've cut out 30% of the human rights abuses in Burundi. So that's the approach you need. Could I have just a, a yes, couple please. of notes to that, Carolyn? Because uh, I continue to be very uh, deeply involved in Burundi on uh, literally a daily basis. Um, given Burundi's history, history, my experience with Burundi the last couple of years is every time there is any kind of um, ripple, there is an exaggerated response because people are so frightened and so worried that Bruni could return to the, to the old history of intercommunal massacres, assassinations, and all the rest. Uh, and so I understand that, but I think it's also important, and the diplomatic community also operates on the same basis oftentimes, magnifying greatly what may not be quite as significant as it appears, though sometimes an exaggerated reaction can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I, my, my urging, and as we look at Bruni these days, is to calm it down. Uh, because, in fact, what's happening is part of a democratic process. I mean, you have a situation in which um, a fairly authoritarian style of governance has been displaced without anything that was very coherent to take its place quickly. Mm -hmm. As you pointed out earlier, the rebel party, uh, the CNFDD was a rebel group, um, didn't have much of an ideology other than getting rid of the oppression and, and undoing the injustices of the past. And so now that there is lack of a very clear structure or direction at the center, there's all sorts of elements competing for influence and, and for position. And, and it's a very fluid, very open process. Um, what Carolyn said is so true. Uh, the absence of trust among key players is, is the paramount, I would argue, the paramount issue. Um, and that is not just as within the CNDFDD, which is having all these internal difficulties, but Frodebu, which has felt uh, excluded and not sufficiently uh, consulted, is now trying to take advantage of that situation, and so you have great growing tensions as between Frodebu and CNDFDD. At the same time that you've got all that going on, 
it's important to understand the fundamentals in Burundi, which are really dramatically transformed. The discourse is no longer ethnic discourse between Hutu and Tutsi. I mean, it's pretty stunning the extent to which that discourse has kind of just gone underground. I mean, not to say there's not potential that it could emerge again, but that is not the, uh, the nature of the discourse, despite the fact that all of the killing and all of the polarization was based upon the whole Tutsi Hutu mobilization in the last couple of decades. Uh, secondly, and, and even more significantly, is what's happening within the military structures, security structures of both the police and the army, where um, the level of cohesion is growing, it's not weakening, it's intensifying. And the sense of pride, actually, of, of, of command officers in both the army and the police, of their separation from politics, which has never been the case historically, is, is pretty uh, astounding. And so I find that there's an awful lot of other stuff happening out there. Uh, the training activities that we are engaged in in Burundi, the Wilson Center and the Burundi Leadership Training Program, uh, continue to expand, not diminish, at the request of Burundians. That is, the president himself, even Rajabu, ironically, earlier, was among those that were ex asking us to expand our training in ways that would address the new set of issues and tensions. And that work has to happen, and that kind of uh, confidence building, trust building, equipping people with capacities to manage their conflicts in a peaceful way is really at the core. You, you identify, and that's really uh, one of the questions that I don't mean to take you aside from your next two questions, yes. but this ties into really one of the things you said at the outset. You define your capa the issue of the Peace Building Commission as principally can being concerned with giving to society, helping societies build the capacity where their peace can be sustainable. I think it's almost yes. as exactly yeah. as you said it. For me, what that means literally is building a culture, a negotiating culture, that is of giving, equi equipping people with the skills, the techniques, and the trust building required so that they can, in fact, uh, solve problems without violence. My hope had been, when I first heard about the Peace Building Commission, I mean, at the very inception, before we mm -hmm. ended up with a lot of the constraints that were imposed in the final mandate, but coming off of the Secretary General's um, uh, commission that was established on threats, security, and whatever the thing was called, it talked about building mediation capacities of the international community. I would carry that, widen that, to build training capacities to, uh, to enable people to build the capacities internally as you would build a health resource or you would build a, an educational resource okay. under UNICEF to build um, the capacity to assist societies develop the skills in order to begin to build this kind of bargaining culture. Uh, is any of that anywhere in the UN system under consideration if, if it's beyond the purview of the ma mandate as it has been conceived at the no, Peace Building Commission? Not in the global sense, but if you take the main priorities that have been identified in Burundi, one of them is rebuilding communities. And it's trying to capture a whole range of issues which recognize the fact that it's not just putting in health care and getting the refugees home, but it's dealing with uh, the land issues. It's dealing with the fact that there are tremendous constraints between a group that has stayed and suffered through the war and those who have fled. I remember when I was first started coming back to Burundi um, five years ago or so, you know, the sort of dark joke that was the dark humor that was floating around was that the people on the hill were saying, gee, we'd be better off if we'd killed somebody and fled to Tanzania, you know, because these guys come home with a, you know, a bag of seed and a hoe and, a w and the wherewithal to start up. And the communities were getting nothing. So that the whole concept of community rebuilding is looking at relations on the hills and uh, rebuilding the economy of the village unit and uh, trying to get an integral, an integrated approach to all of that. So there's room in there to build that in, but I wouldn't want to pretend that yeah. we've gone far enough. Let me touch quickly on the other two questions. Um, how does the commission work, and particularly in the terms of its advisory role? Well, we set out in, um, we set out in uh, January to uh, design a schedule of work for the, the Commission, uh, which would take it away from the procedural wrangles and that would get it into actually engaging with the government of Burundi on what was a peace-building strategy. 
And uh, we've done that through a series of meetings th where we've either brought the Burundians or the Sierra Leoneans in from uh, overseas, or we've brought them in through video conferencing. And uh, at each iteration, we have tried to capture what the beginnings of a strategy was. And uh, we've depended uh, very heavily on the teams on the ground. And in both in Burundi and in Sierra Leone, the idea has been to build up some kind of steering committee process, co-chaired by the UN and by the government, which the civil society and the donors and uh, others and the IFIs and the political partners are uh, involved. And that process uh, it has produced several it iterations of a document which will be the strategic framework for the Peace Building Commission in Burundi, signed off by the government, with commitments by the government, and with commitments from the international community. And uh, then the proof of the pudding will be uh, how do we turn those commitments into action. And that has to be through the actions of all the existing players. Peace building is not something new that we're going to add to everybody's agenda. Peace building will have to be the lens through which we will focus what we are doing. And so that it will be incumbent on the uh, players on the ground to say that this strategy is going to change what I do. Because now what I do has to meet the test of are we addressing in the first instance the fault lines in Burundi. And that doesn't mean everybody stops everything they're doing. I mean, a lot of the basic beginnings of development that uh, still has to take place. Um, but the partners will agree that if we don't address these critical priorities, then the risk is there. Now, at a certain point, you have to say, have we met the challenge? And we're going to have to define how we do that. In terms of its role as an advisory body, it is set up to advise the General Assembly or the Security Council. And we haven't figured out what. The short answer is, you know, we're just going to get on with the job. So we'll <laughs> see what we can do. Martin, your question on the, I don't think the work of the Commission and the strategic approach has quite reached that level of sophistication in terms, because the strategy is, is dealing with the traditional concepts of, of corruption. Um, but I think it's uh, uh, highly possible for us to factor it in through the operational agencies because the strategic approach has t can only hit the high points and uh, we're nervous about trying to get everything in the first time around. Where w the test will come is can we build in the procedures along the way and, and develop the tools that will make peace building something different and that will answer the test of are we doing something different. Um, I like to quote uh, Rita Mae Brown who said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> and so that our challenge is to find something that will give us the different result. And that means that all of the actors, and in this case the operational actors, have to continue to work uh, to refine their tools to do something different at the end of the day. So the work that you're doing, in fact, through the operational agencies like the bank and the UNDP is, in fact, hopefully the way that we can get at some of these issues. Okay. Uh, we have time for one last question, and then we will have to uh, uh, recess the meeting. Yes, right over here on the left. Your name, please. Your name, please. Sorry. Uh, I'm Rose Jackson. I work with NDI. And my question really stems from having that viewpoint of our work. And I'm kind of curious uh, if you guys have operationalized or coordinated a policy for how you plan on reaching out to those partners that are currently working in the field, um, at least through NDI. I know a lot of organizations are working right now to address these very questions about sustainability mm -hmm. and the work that we do as far as um, how that delivers, which I think is part and parcel with the question of sustainability. So um, I'm curious as to how you plan on reaching out to organizations, communicate with them, and then hopefully be able to pull them in to this cohesive vision with mm -hmm. many organizations that tend to want to go their own. 
Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, for the moment, uh, we are constrained to working in those countries that are on the agenda of the Peace Building Commission. Uh, currently, as I said, that's Burundi and Sierra Leone. Um, although we are trying to encourage the Commission members to start to move more quickly on the process of identifying other countries because the architecture that's been put in place, if it only addresses two countries, will have failed miserably. Um, however, in addition, the internally within the, the Secretariat, uh, we have a, a role not only of bringing the uh, international community together in support of the Peace Building Commission efforts, but also to try to identify ways where we can apply this approach uh, to other situations that go beyond the list of countries on the agenda of the PBC. Now, the way we see that is that, first of all, it, uh, it will help us to meet the test of uh, addressing peace building in the broadest possible way, but also using the processes that we're developing with the Peace Building Commission uh, in such a way that we will get a, a follow-on effect, a ripple effect, a value-added effect, uh, however you want to call it. Um, the most of the uh, most of the the work, as I said, will focus more on the country level, and that uh, we will rely very much on the uh, uh, the country operators, you know, to drive that process of ensuring that the uh, the players on the ground do have that common sense that I was talking about in the beginning, that common definition of where the fault lines are and what the problems are all about. Now, in terms of a much broader level of bringing the partners together to talk about peace building issues generally, uh, right now we don't have the capacity to do that. Um, but I could envisage a situation in the future so we have the capacity to reach out to individual institutions that have interesting ideas, but you know it's it's difficult for us to run a process and then be accused of not being inclusive enough. And as I said before, this particular field is is mushrooming. You could never run a an exercise that would be a, a inclusive. Um, but maybe over time we can envisage a process whereby. Uh, we could generate, you know, a, a series of seminars on peace building and bring in some of the practitioners as lessons learned. Uh, and this is definitely within our mandate. In fact, one of the things we tried to do when we got started was talk to some of the organizations operating in the New York area, mainly because, you know, we want to get our member states across the road and and sort of on a uh, in a way that. Uh, that's easy on their time and working with International Peace Academy or uh, Council for International Cooperation, those kinds of organizations, and uh, design a set of seminars to talk about specific subjects. So uh, we've started that process and uh, hopefully we can develop it into uh, something more. But it's early days yet. Carolyn, thank you so much. I uh, don't think there's anything more challenging than trying to start up a new institutional entity within a bureaucracy of the size, magnitude of, of the United Nations, uh, watching uh, the American government function and looking at the history of the Office of Post-Conflict Stabilization and Reconstruction, there's some interesting parallels in terms mm -hmm. of the challenges and the uh, perspectives and, and, and the visioning that goes into that process. But I thank you so much for sharing your 